Oh, hello there. How you guys doing? My goodness, feels like it's been forever. Pretty much has, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it has. Yeah, I pulled a lens today, man. I took a little nap this afternoon. Wow. Mm -hmm. Hi, Lynn. Hey, Heather. How you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm well. Did you have a good Easter? Yes, thank you. Yes. Good. I'm glad. Hey, Daryl. Nobody's coming on camera for me tonight. I've been threatened. I can't turn the camera on, Lynn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Carmen. Yeah, no, I've been under the weather today, so no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I'll go on, but don't show my face. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I don't feel presentable, but I'm, I, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> Golly, those guys are so funny. You're so funny. Hey, Daryl, how you doing? Doing well, Lynn. How are you doing? Glad you're presentable and, and you're not afraid to go online. <laughs> How was your Easter? <laughs> Is Denise going to make it tonight? I hope so. Talked to her last night. Mm -hmm. Good. Hope so too. Hope so too. When we had a beautiful time at the well this morning, it was a small group. Um, yeah, just kind of people scattering and didn't, you know, didn't make it today. But uh, it was so beautiful because we have a, a couple of uh, tables, just as you walk into the well, it's where we usually break bread and just kind of do some sharing, Bible study, prayer time, whatever. And we just uh, stayed there and had a small group time. It was so phenomenal. And I love it, you know, when the Lord just switches gears like that, you just have to kind of roll with it. <laughs> so we rolled with it and it was wonderful. Hey, Di, good to see you, my friend. Di. Well, she's out there somewhere. I see you're unmuted on your mic, Di, but I don't hear you. Oh, hello. Can there you, you hear go. me now? <laughs> there you go. How you doing, girl? Good. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Did you have a good Easter? We had a wonderful Easter. Good. Did you have all the kids there? Um, all the local kids. So four yeah. of the six were here. Yeah. 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 Alex <laughs> gets to come home in June, so that'll be nice. So oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, he's the one in New Mexico in the Air Force. So. Wonderful. Yeah, I remember when my baby joined right after high school. It's like, what in the world? The nest emptied fast, and then he just went into faraway places. It was like, ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, our job is to make them strong enough to fly away, but they fly away. It still never feels okay when they fly away. At least not. No, it feels so wrong. Nobody yeah. prepares you for the empty nest. <laughs> they don't. Yeah. No, my grandkids will help you a little bit. Yep. Eventually they'll be here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they'll help you a little bit and you'll say you know it's true what they say I used to think it was so horrible to hear people say the good thing is they go home you know <laughs> now that I have to right across the yard I'm not far ever finding myself saying but they go home <laughs> <laughs> and that is a good thing well it looks like this might be it I don't know right right at uh right at the the hour honey you want to come in and get open us up in prayer I, every and most every week, I just have to prove to y'all that Doug is still putting up with me. <laughs> I don't <laughs> that. So I have him come in and open us up in prayer and uh, say hello to you guys. He doesn't like that camera any more than you guys do. Hey, everyone. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm barely ready for prime time, too, Carmen. <laughs> he's, he's, he's presentable, but he doesn't like to be out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> Doggy's <laughs> reaction to that. Okay, let's have Doug open us up in prayer and we'll get on with it, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for a beautiful day that you gave us, Lord. And <clears throat> a rich time this morning at the well and then a nice restful afternoon. God, together, quality time is so, so beautiful. And Lord, we just uh, thank you for each heart that's on this phone call tonight, Lord. And those who will be listening uh, later on to the recording, uh, we just ask that you would speak to each heart. And Lord, give Gracie the 
uh, the message that you have put on her heart, Lord. We just ask for your anointing, Lord, and just speak through her. And uh, we just uh, thank you again for this, this beautiful message tonight. And God, we just, uh, again, give you all the glory and praise. And it's in your precious holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, honey. Mm -hmm. yeah, so there we go. You know, um, I forgot to mention, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but Michael Johnson, who joins us frequently, um, is struggling with his health and to, his, to the extent that he won't make it here to the farm uh, next month to be baptized the way he planned to be. So keep Michael in your prayers, if you don't mind. You know, Di, as you were talking about, uh, you know, nobody prepares you for this empty nest. And, and I was thinking about one of the things that the Lord put on my heart this season is that we have you know, have a tendency to get through the holidays, you know, the, the biggest holiday we just, in my opinion, uh, that we just had, you know, we go through Good Friday, Easter, you know, Holy Week, we do all that, and we get back down to business, right, we just kind of <laughs> got to move on from it, I think, way too soon, and so there are some things that, um, not, that the Lord wants to, us to consider, to, to share, to ponder, because we don't ever want to feel that emptiness, right, that the now, that season has never gone away. And, and I'm, I'm forever saying, you know, that we need to keep our eyes on the cross. We can't lose sight of that because you see, it's remembering um, what Christ did for us, the price he paid, he redeemed us, he paid a debt we could never pay. It's what propels us is if we keep our eyes on that all year long, every single day. So uh, the message, of course, is entitled Then What? But, you know, Jesus was arrested. Uh, we know he was beaten. He was flogged. His skin was, you know, torn off his body. Uh, you know, he, his beard, his hair were pulled out by the locks. He was spit on. He hung on the cross to die. He was buried, resurrected. So then what happens after? I think there are a lot of things that uh, we need to pay close attention to. But before we look at what happened next after the crucifixion, uh, I want us to, to, to be reminded of and to look at some of the supernatural things that took place when Jesus, you know, during that process of the um, crucifixion because i think again we lose sight of that and 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 it's very interesting as we study through we'll see that the disciples you know they they had seen it all with jesus right they had seen the the healings uh, re resurrecting the dead casting out the demons walking on the water calming the sea they had seen it all and yet you know even uh, knowing that and, and experiencing supernatural things at the time of crucifixion uh, they ran off and hid like wussy. So listen, if it could happen to them, it can happen to us. We see in John um, 18, 2, it says, and Judas who betrayed him also knew the place where Jesus often met them, him there with the disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. And Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? I want to stop right there and just call our attention to the fact that this, you know, we, in the movies, like we saw Passion of the Christ again, right, over the holiday, you see a small group of soldiers come get Jesus, right? It's pretty, it's pretty uneventful, except for the ear getting whacked off. It's pretty, pretty, pretty simple. But a detachment of troops, when you look at the full meaning of this, this is like, uh, you know, three to six hundred soldiers this is like the elite group of soldiers imagine that that they thought they needed to send 600 soldiers you know to go get jesus they obviously somewhere in their spirit they had to know that this was a big deal and so there were uh really more between three and 600 probably more like 600 and so uh so again G jesus knows what's coming you know i love this of course we have to speculate a lot of things but you know, you know, he's in the garden. Uh, he asked three times, Lord, if it's your will, take it from me. He was in agony, he was sweating blood. You know, he was 100% God, 100% man, and he knew what was coming. But it seems like here, he's just kind of resolved the fact that, okay, now's the time and I have everything I need. I am the son of God. And so they, so he uh, knows these things and, and, and he uh, went forward to them. He approaches them, right? And he says, whom are you seeking? And they answered Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, to them i am he and judas who betrayed him also stood with them now now when he said that to them i am he they drew back and fell to the ground can you imagine that 600
hundred <laughs> soldiers just all of a sudden uh, drawing back and falling to the ground. Well, I want to take a look at that real quick here because it's uh, Jesus uses that word um, ego in me again, and the soldiers wanted to know who are you and they probably expected him to give a you know like the average answer which would be well i'm jesus of nazareth i'm I'm who you're looking for but instead he answered them god answered them uh by saying i am so john 18 6 tells us that as soon then as 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 he had said unto them i am he they went backward fell to the ground so more accurate a picture, if you will, would be as soon uh, then as he said unto them, I am, they went backward and fell to the ground. So the words that went backward come from a Greek word. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. In this case, the word depicts the soldiers and temple police staggering and stumbling, like losing their way, like they're all staggering backward as if some force had hit them and it's pushing them backward. So the, the, the word fell in the Greek, um, you know, which it means to fall, but it was used often to to describe or depict a person who fell so hard, it appeared that he fell dead or fell like a corpse. So here we are, it looks as if something pushes them back, some supernatural force, of course it was, right? And they forcefully, like a corpse, fell 600 of the biggest bullies they had. You know, we need to continue to be reminded again of all the things that led up to the crucifixion. This is a huge deal. The, the, the disciples see this. Uh, it's a supernatural thing that just happened. It's not just a let's whistle Dixie and go off to the cross. This is a supernatural thing. Jesus was saying, you know, with that word, uh, you know, I am. That is the word that is used to describe God. It's the same uh, word with uh, when Moses said, you know, who, who do they say, wh- who I call you? He says, I am. So they knew that it was God speaking to them. And they knew that it was a supernatural act. You know what? If I was one of the 600, I'm telling you now, I would have run for the hills. I would have said, oh my goodness, what are we messing with here? I don't care what's going on. I'm taking my torch and sword and go down the road. But they went on with it. And then there was that darkness. Wow. You know, listen, we see in the movies again where it looks like, you know, a storm came by, storm clouds, whatever. Uh, that was certainly to a passion of the Christ. But, uh, you know, it, it, it was dark over the whole land from noon until three in the afternoon. And it, it was now about noon is what it says in Luke 23. And darkness came over the whole land until three because the sun's light failed. Not because there was a big storm, not because there were gray clouds, not be, it was because the sun's light failed. And the significance here is that in the Old Testament, of course, darkness like that is, is, is uh, it was seen as a sign of judgment. So these people know, right? They, uh, they they know the Old Testament word. They know the words of the prophets, right? They know. And so now the whole land goes down. The sun uh, light failed. I think that is so beautiful. And so, you know, it's a, of course, it was a sign of our sins were being placed vicariously on the sons of, on the son of the living God. And he was taking that judgment, if you will. He was our substitute, right? So darkness is a sign of divine judgment. That alone, forget the soldiers, right? And go on to the darkness. That alone should make the, the disciples and everyone there, you know, just be in awe. The sun's light failed. My goodness, miraculous thing that we just kind of skip over and push fast forward and go on to the crucifixion. And then, uh, you know, the curtains. The curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. That's significant like, because, you know, if you've never studied this, you may not know. Um, it's like 60 feet high, or as Doug would say, six stories high is this curtain, and it's four inches thick. And all of a sudden, shoom, it split from top to bottom. Well, that, that veil, that curtain, if you will, you know, was uh, really symbolic of the only person that's uh, allowed to be honest in the presence of God, of course, was a, you know, the high priest, and your average person couldn't go in there. So it was God's way of saying, shoom, I give access to the throne of God, to my son, to every living being. So he made a way for us through Jesus. And this is the way he tore the veil that separated us from him. What a beautiful thing. I don't know about you, but if I'm standing there and I'm seeing a six story, that four inch thick 
uh, you know, curtain just drop, excuse me, just tear from top to bottom. I'm gonna stand up and take notice. And yet the disciples who had already seen a whole lot of stuff before now, you know, after the crucifixion ran like wussies in here. So again, if it can happen to them, if they could be subject to that, then so can we. So there was the curtain, then there was the earthquake. Well, you know, the it says the earthquake and the rocks were split. And the significance here is earthquakes, uh, you know, were common in Palestine, though there was nothing common about this one. So the time I mean, uh, does suggest that this was a supernatural event along with the, the curtain, along with the darkness, along with the soldiers, right? So earthquakes in the Bible often accompanied, um, you know, divine revelation, if you will. It says in Luke 19, as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. So that's a good example of this whole stone the earthquake thing, right? If they're silent, uh, if my people really are silent, that even the stones will cry, it said the earthquake. And then there were dead people raised. And, you know, the tombs were also open and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. You know, we think about his resurrection, but we think about this miraculous time, you know, when uh, the earth shook and so the rocks rolled away, the graves were open and people were raised. The significance is the opening of the tombs would likely have occurred again as a result of that earthquake. Quake. It supernaturally opened up uh, the tombs, right? The miracle of raising uh, many saints from the dead uh, would have been, you know, those Old Testament saints, of course. So these resurrections demonstrate Jesus' victory over death. Look at all the things, you know, just above and beyond the, the physical, you know, uh, murder of Jesus, right? And the miraculous resurrection. Forget, you know, all that aside, just look at all these other things, you know, that that bring this the, the miraculous, the supernatural front and center. As we look at Easter, we can't we can't ignore these things. And Jesus had left them. The apostles and disciples were terrified. Here they are again. He's been with them. They've seen miracles. They just saw a whole bunch of supernatural stuff. And what they do, they, his closest people they, that, that should have understood what was going on, they locked themselves in a room. They hid. They were scared to death that the Roman, uh, you know, uh, Jewish leaders might come after them and do the same thing to them that they had done to Jesus. They were afraid to be persecuted. So they became so afraid but they seldom even went outside during the daylight. They didn't want to be seen. These are, these are his core group. These are the people, again, that uh, I witness things that we only read about today. It's amazing. Human nature is to succumb to that. So if it can happen to them, it can happen to us, right? We know that near the end of his ministry uh, here on earth, that many people had abandoned him. I'm sure you remember reading about that. And we read that, you know, if they departed from us, they weren't really part of us, right? So, but many had abandoned him. Uh, there were, of course, women and uh, just some of the unnamed disciples and, uh, you know, that stuck with the hardcore believers, right? But the night of his betrayal, even his, his disciples fled from him. And you if, imagine that, you know, right? Peter denied the Lord three times, you know, from an outside perspective, you know, that Jesus movement, it might have looked like a big flop, right? Because Jesus died a criminal staff and his followers that had been there for all this time in his ministry took off like horses. Said his disciples did come back, praise God. And the risen Lord Jesus appeared to them in Acts 1 3. And at this time, the Apostle Paul numbers the disciples to over 500. That's, it. That's pretty much where it would have been at that time. 1 Corinthians 15 says, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Isn't that beautiful? So the number uh, seems to you know, match up, if you will, with John's appraisal that many of his disciples did, in fact, return, uh, turn back to him. And they no, 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 excuse me, turned back and no longer walked with him. So we read that in John uh, 66. So uh, in John 660, what it says on hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Wow. You know what? Hello. <laughs> we look at it, it's only by faith, right? That we that we believe that, you know, it's, it's faith is just believing what we can't see. But uh, so many of them said, you know, this is just too hard and and who could accept it? 
And aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words that I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. And he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the father has enabled them. So from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. He's basically saying it's, it's foretold. You know, if you don't get it, you don't get it. Uh, lots of people aren't going to get it. But, uh, you know, th th you need to be aware of what belief looks like. And Jesus knew from the beginning who would be there and who wouldn't. So many turned away. So communication 101. We're kind of moving on now into the, to the message for us tonight. But communication, you guys have heard this probably a million times, you know. And that is you, you tell people what you're going to tell them. And then you tell them. And then you tell them what you told them. <laughs> that's communication 101. Certainly in business, I did that with my family. And that's exactly what Jesus did, um, you know, during his time here. So first he, he walked with them, right? He's a, he's a brother with them. Yeah, closer than a brother with him. He taught them how to be fishers of men. He poured out everything he could into, uh, you know, his disciples. So he walked with them. He told them what was coming. He told them that he would be denied. He told them he would be betrayed. He told them all this stuff, right? So he told them what he was going to tell them. And then the prophecy was fulfilled. What he told them came true. Uh, he was crucified and he rose again. So they'd already he told him what he was going to tell him, and then he told him, and then he's going to you know, tell him what he told him. So here he is. He's crucified, and he rose again, and exactly as he had told him. But then the beautiful, compassionate side, I believe, of Jesus was he spent 40 days teaching them. And, you know, it's like a show and tell. Again, it's like I told him what was coming. It came. Now, I'm gonna, now i got to help him along here. Luke writes, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So he is driving home the message. I, he told us, he foretold what would happen. It happened. And now he's right behind it, reinforcing that message of what happened and what and how victory is ours and how death can be conquered. Luke 24, we're going to go through this, uh, quite a bit of reading here. So follow along with me, if you will. Luke 24, 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that day to a village uh, uh, called Emmaus, and which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they talked together, all these things which had happened. They're, so they're part of the, the disciple group, right? It's just happened. They're walking along. They're traveling, you know, uh, you know, down the road. They're leaving Jerusalem. Uh, they've gotten those seven miles away or miles away. And they're talking about all the things that took place. So it was while they conversed and they reasoned, trying to figure it out, right? What really happened here? We, you know, our time, Jesus died and his body's gone. That, that Jesus uh, himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. So here they are walking along the way, talking about it, trying to reason, with, trying to figure out what just happened. And uh, someone comes alongside him and they don't recognize him because uh, their eyes were restrained. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and you are sad? And the one of those uh, whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which happen in these days? So he's saying, where have you been, right? And, and Jesus said to him, I love it. He's kind of playing them, right? He said, what things? And, and so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. They, they see, they're not bought in, right? They, we, we were open, but his body was there and now it's gone, right? So we were hoping. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happen. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those uh, of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but they did not see. So they go there, still find it empty. Then he said to them, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. So he's basically, they don't know it's Jesus yet, but he said, what are you nuts? <laughs> you guys, have, you should know better, right? 
Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And, and begin, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded them in all the scriptures of things concerning himself. And then they drew near to the village where they were going. And he indicated that what he would have, he needed to go farther. But they constrained him saying, abide with us for it is forward evening and the day is as far spent. And he went on to stay with them. And, you know, it's nighttime, but buddy, don't keep going down the road, right? Again, they don't know it's Jesus yet. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. And that very second, boom, they know it's Jesus. And they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Imagine the, the, the joy and the defeat and everything that went through their hearts, right? That when they realized, we've been walking with Jesus all this time, and then poof, he's gone. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures. I really think they're trying to say, why didn't we see it? You know, our heart didn't burn within us. So they rose up at that very hour and they went back to Jerusalem, right? And they found the 11, those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen indeed. And he has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So here we are again. Now it's all happened. Uh, just like Jesus said, oh, you foolish ones, don't you know? I mean, it, I, I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you. i tell you and I'll tell you what I told you. And that's really what we're looking at here. And so now they're saying he has risen. We saw it. We saw him with our own eyes. So he appeared to his disciples. So it says, now as they said these things, you're know, telling them the story, right? Jesus himself stood in the midst of it. Now you'll read different accounts in the gospels, of course, but you know, where he walked through the door, just kind of showed up. Now, remember they're in a locked home by, behind closed doors. And Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and had supposed they had seen a spirit. Now, this word, if you break it down, means a ghost. So here they are. Again, I'm telling no, I'm beating a dead horse. But they saw everything that Jesus had, all the miracles they saw before the crucifixion. They saw supernatural things on the night of the crucifixion. He told them, I'm coming back. He, he told them everything, right? Trying to pour everything into them. And now they're, they're hiding behind locked doors. He shows up. And they're so scared, they thought it was a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do you, does doubt arise in your hearts? You know, be oh, my hands and my feet, behold it. You know, this, that it is myself, handle me, say, touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So he's basically saying, prove it to yourself. Here I am, right? So when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still uh, did not believe for joy and, and, and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and he ate in their presence. I love this. I was sharing this morning about how it's, to me, it's just like Jesus wanted um, <clears throat> everybody to see that he did conquer death. And that what is, uh, you know, what's ahead for all of us, it's not just some, you know, vapor ghost like thing, you know, we are, we are going to get a new body, right? And, he, and I think he's trying to show that and, uh, human isn't the right word, but that, you know, the, the, the man side of him, in other words, he's hungry, he's going to eat, and we're going to have those things and we go to heaven too, not just some mystical kind of thing. So he opened their understanding that they might be able to comprehend. And he said, these are the words I spoke to you while I was still with you. I'm going to tell you, right, <laughs> that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So I'm telling, going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I tell you, and then I'm, he's cleaning up. He's telling them, I told you these things. And then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witness of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued, <clears throat> excuse me, with power from on high. So he's saying, this is, it's, it's showtime now, guys, and I'm going to equip you. And, and, and prophecy has now been fulfilled. I've shown you myself. It was necessary that I endure what I endured to, 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 to complete my father's will, right? But now you sit tight. What you sit right here in Jerusalem until you are, uh, you know, get power from most time. And he led them out as far as Bethany. 
and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And now came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into, he into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. So they finally get it, right? They're finally there. They get it. And they're continuing. I love that. that they're continually in the temple. They didn't just take a, a fleeting, wow, it's wonderful. Jesus died on the cross and he rose again. And really that's a, a large part. But many, so many of us do. This beautiful holiday comes and no matter how serene and how uh, solemn we are and how we reflect and if we fast and if we pray and whatever, it's right back down to business just a day or two after that. But they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Matthew 28, 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And then they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, in other words, it's all tied together, right? It's, it's, it's there for a reason. So therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded to you. And surely uh, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So he tells them to go, you know, he has, he's already ascending and he's telling them, I, I have the authority, I have it all, all of it. And I'm empowering you. I'm going to give you uh, the Holy Spirit to empower you. Pentecost, you know, we, we think about all these different things that happen or take place in the Bible. Pentecost is actually uh, took place, um, you know, it depends on the, uh, the way that they uh, you count days from the feast, right? So Pentecost itself means 50. So it was somewhere between seven and 10 days after Jesus uh, ascends to heaven. So just the, it's right around the corner, right? So he says, sit tight. I'm going to send you help. And I'm going to send you help that will be with you forever and ever. Amen. And so Pentecost happens, right? But here's the deal. The body of Christ in, it, it is held together by the Holy Spirit. And, and I think that so many of us, maybe it was doctrinal differences, you know, like myself that, you know, really were, uh, I was taught that none of the supernatural stuff still exists for today. Why would it? Christ was here. He died. He's ascended, you know, what, it, but that's completely uh, the, the opposite of what the word actually teaches. Right. And so what it, the word tells us, they, they rely on scripture that says, when that which is perfect has come, all this will cease. And they think that was when Jesus first came, but it wasn't. It's when Jesus comes again, we won't need to see the supernatural things yet those supernatural things are so bad why did the curtain tear why did the earth shake why did the sun's light fail why did the soldiers get hit to the ground as if they'd been you know just uh, hit by lightning why did all these things happen you know and so it says uh, in verse 12 now concerning spiritual gifts brother and i do not want you to be ignorant you know that you were gentiles carried away to these dumb idols however you are led therefore i make known to you that no one speaking by the spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now stop right there and think about that. Nobody can proclaim Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And of course, you guys, I'm sure this is very familiar scripture to you. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are, are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works in all of them. But the manifestation of Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all for to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another gifts of healing by the same spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning spirits to another different kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues but one of the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he will you know what we, we are done if we don't have the Holy Spirit. And yet, you know, there's a, there's a, a reverence for the Holy Spirit. You know, we talk about the Holy Spirit, even with those doctrines that say there's nothing supernatural going to happen anymore because, you know, that was a thing in the past. It was just God showing off at Pentecost or something. And those things cease to exist. But that is not true. And I, so I want to walk you through a few things. You know, when the Holy Spirit uh, visited those 120 disciples at Pentecost, you know what happened? They became the body of Christ. And the very essence of who we are as the body of Christ began at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon those people. That was the very first church. And so how do we 
years later, decades later, centuries later, get to a point where we don't think that's important anymore. We think, praise Jesus, that he rose again, he's in heaven, he made a way, redeeming, but we forget all this other stuff. Listen, they had the Holy Spirit, right? They were given the Holy Spirit, just like you are, just like I am. And they had stories. They had no praise band. They had no seminaries that people went to. Nobody got ordained. There was no written word. They had the Holy Spirit and they had stories. And that's it. They, ought to, that, and they ignited the entire world uh, becoming the first, the first church. You know, they became the church, right? Then uh, the New Testament, it, it should say, especially the Gospels. The Gospels, they didn't even get written. They didn't get penned for 70 years after the crucifixion of Christ. Think about that for a second. You, know, you think, especially if you watch The Chosen, right? You think, oh, well, they're, they're taking all their notes and you think it's all available. And then you forget to look at what kind of period of time was there. So, so there's 70 years before uh, the, the writings, you know, of the gospel first even came out. They had the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and what did they have? They had stories where they could tell over and over and over. You know, history offers us a, a little direct evidence, of course, about the events of this period. But it does suggest that early Christians were engaged in one of the most basic human activities, and that's storytelling. You know, stories can keep things alive. I, I often uh, talk with my family. I, I keep my uh, my the, my heritage alive. I talk about my parents. I to, to the kids. I talk about their grandparents. I tell stories. I want to keep it alive. You know, they, I know they're in heaven, and that's a beautiful thing. And I praise God for it. But I keep the legacy of them alive. And you know, we can laugh at things that happen as if they happened just uh, a few minutes ago. So storytelling is a huge component to who we are in Christ. They had the Holy Spirit. And they had stories from the very first church on 70 years before the Gospels were even penned. In the words of Mike White, it says, it appears that between the death of Jesus and the writing of the first Gospel, which was Mark, they clearly are just telling stories. They're just doing what I do in my family on a much bigger scale with much bigger stakes, right? They're passing on the tradition of what happened to Jesus, what he stood for, what he did orally by telling it and retelling it. And as Mike White says, in the process, they're defining Jesus for themselves. And so, you know, the storytelling is such a huge component. We talk about it often about testimonies and things like that, right? But, you know, we look at the Bible, we have the richness of the word of God, but it hasn't been there for all this time, right? It wasn't there for them. So what they had where they did have the the, the words of the prophets, they had, you know, the, uh, the Old Testament, but they had not, they didn't have the benefit to say, hey, read this. You know, it could come to be in our lifetime that we don't have a Bible, that we don't have it in our hands. And you know what? It makes me really sad that not just some, but I think most people don't spend enough time in the word of God to be able to continue to tell the stories. I don't think they do. And so here we're looking at a big difference of the first church. When the first church was established, we didn't have crutches. We had the Holy Spirit and we had stories. And you know what? We still have that today. We have the Holy Spirit and we should have stories. When did the Bible go to print? Well, the Gutenberg uh, Press uh, mass produced over 100 copies of the Bible for the first time in 1452. And the first printed Bible in mass production, which was 100 copies in the US was 1535. So we haven't always had the written word of God, right, to go upon, to build the church. We haven't always had it. And we, we might look at, at countries like China, how awful it is. And we pray for those people, tearing little pieces of scripture and hand, handing it to each other. We are sitting here with the freedom to read the word of God but you know what? We need to ignite it with the Holy Spirit and we need to start telling those stories, right? We need to be able to tell the story just the same as I do with my family with absolute clarity. I can recall stories, some of them funny, some of them sad. I can bring it right back to life with a story. The same is true, again, only much bigger stakes, um, you know, when it comes to the gospel. So the moral of all this miraculous story, the supernatural things that, that surround that event, 
that we just celebrated last week is that we have the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has not dimmed, has not gone to sleep, did not just show up for Pentecost and go back to sleep. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. It's time we acknowledged it, and it's time we got the Holy Spirit out of the box in our lives, understanding that in the beginning, our, our brothers and sisters, from the beginning of the churches, all they had was the Holy Spirit and stories. So we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the living, breathing word of God. We have an advantage that they didn't have where we could say, let me read it to you. Let's read it together. But many people, they don't read the their word of God outside of a church setting at all. You know, what does it say? Like an hour a month is what most uh, churchgoers spend, how much they spend in, in the word of God. So yeah, I guess they are freaked out about not having a Bible one day. But if we know what the Bible teaches so well, you know, it's like we can tell those stories without looking it up. We don't need a crutch here. We have the Holy Spirit and we have the stories, right? We don't need to fear not having a Bible in our hands one day if we know it so well that we can, for, we can tell those stories with the same kind of light that I do in my own family, right? With our legacy. And we have those stories, but you know what? Really do we share a testimony? So many people, I can't even talk about Jesus because I wouldn't where to start. I don't know where the verses are and it wouldn't forget about that. The Bible says that the Lord will give you the words you need when you need them. And so if we have the Holy Spirit and we're willing to tell the story and we trust the Holy Spirit to give us the words that we need when we need them, we don't have to fumble around with any of that stuff. We have everything we need. So if the church itself can be founded, you know, with just not, shouldn't say just with respectfully, right? With the Holy Spirit, Having eyewitness that after 70 years, how many people are still saying I was there, right? But I'm, you know, eyewitness or or the accounts. My mother told me this, my father told me that my uncle was there, you know, whatever it is, we still have the ability to do that. So we have the power, we have the word, and we have the stories. $64 question is, are we gonna live like it? Because quite frankly, these days in America, we see that we're not living like that. And we're living like worried. What are we going to do? We get persecuted. Well, you know what? <laughs> Read your Bible. You'll see what happens. You know you're going to get persecuted if you live long enough. And, and, and we worry about what if they take our Bibles? Well, half the time, you know, you need to be more worried, I guess, because they take your smartphone. Because most people, that's where you have the word of God hidden away on your smartphone for nobody to see. And so it's time to walk boldly, guys. You know, it is the beginning of those uh, labor pains. And, you know, as we start feeling, oh, my gosh, what do we have? Let's think back on what they had. Now, human nature was still to go run and hide and to lock doors because they had just seen what Jesus already told them that they were going to see. And so when it manifested, they freaked out. Are we going to live like that? Are we going to be on uh, the uh, blessed people on the other side of all this stuff that was foretold and it came to be? Are we going to live like that? Are we going to live with the story and the, and, the, and the message of the cross in our hearts, in our lives, and certainly coming off our lips every day of, the, of our lives, or is that just about Easter and the Easter bunny? And that's it for me, guys. So anybody have anything? Oh awesome, awesome, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> you know, you resonate with me, girl. <laughs> Telling you, oh my goodness. You know, I, I, I confess in my flesh that recently I have been overwhelmed by certain things going on in my life. Mm -hmm. And I repented and came to God, Lord, you know, Nice. The enemy is at work and he's just attacking me here, 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 and here. And so, and then I just realized I'm so sorry. I've been trying to do this all my all by myself. Right. I, I've been walking in the flesh and not relying and trusting you, Lord, in your spirit to guide, to direct me, to show me what I need to do. And I, and I just took that burden on myself and, you know, <laughs> it was not mine to do. And so... God in his gentleness just showed me, okay, you know what? He had me see it in scripture and in, in the lessons that we are studying right now. And I'm just like, oh Lord, I'm so sorry. And, and it was just, I was like set free once again. And it's just like, okay, Satan kicking you to the curb. No, 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 no. no. Or, you know, I, yeah. So, I mean, it's just, the spirit is alive in yes. us when we receive Jesus, but so many of us don't receive that. 
no. and, and don't understand that he didn't leave us helpless. That's you know, right. he left a, a part of himself of you, so to speak. And so we can stand firm and we can stand on his promises in the word and claim them and, and recite them over our lives and, and have that victory. We do not need to go around depressed, poor, broken, heartbroken Christians. I mean, that's not what he wants. And especially in the days we are living in, yeah. I mean, my goodness, we got to armor up we got to be prepared and unfortunately i have to tell you um I'm, I'm sad to say this that i did not always read my bible when i was younger and so my memory is not what it should be you know or could be but you know what i have enough of those scriptures in me you know that i and you're right you're That's so right scared. they come to me when That's i need them. he draws it out of me when i read something it's like i may forget it but he didn't and he brings it out of me. And so <clears throat> that's right. You just, oh my gosh, girl, you always, you always. Oh my goodness. One for God, I tell you. <laughs> Thank you. I got it so, so good. And I just, I really relate to what you're saying because you guys heard me share a couple of days ago about how, you know, I was trying to fix everything. You know, the world came crashing in and, and I nearly, <laughs> I nearly lost everything in my, my spirit, my heart and my, everything. Cause I was trying to fix it. It's not until we, get to that place of humility we realize we did nothing it's comical really and you realize how much stress and stuff we put into things that we have absolutely no control over but you know what the enemy is alive and well we're just talking about this uh this morning you know about spiritual warfare and things like that and carmen i thought of you because i know that you struggle with sleep and i was i was sharing a story um about how, uh, you know, the, the devil, he knows when we're sleeping, oh guys, okay? <laughs> you know, God it can counsel us even in our sleep, but if the devil sees a way, you know, to, to, to bring forth a, a dream or something when we sleep to torment us, he's gonna do it. And so that's what he does to me sometimes. And the other night I just shot out of bed, oh my goodness, my adrenaline's going, because it was a demonic thing that was uh, this dream or whatever, this demonic thing was going after one of my children. And so I was getting up and it was almost like a symbolic of I'm going to fight it, right? I'm going to get rid of it. And of course, immediately went into prayer. The, uh, the two of us did pray through that. But the enemy guys, we got to know, you know, we, I know how to do that warfare when I'm awake, right? When I'm asleep, I got to know how to handle it if that attacks me during my sleep. The enemy wants to crush God's people. And unfortunately, in so many areas, that's working. So we have got to armor up. This is not a lame thing. I'm sure you're probably so sick of hearing from me uh, that you don't even want to tune in each week. But the bottom line is we've got, we've got everything we need. And I don't know about you, but I'm about to see some supernatural things. I am going to see the glory of God in my lifetime. I know it. And so I'm waiting for it. I'm, I'm, I'm fully expecting to see that. You know, my own daughter was weeping in church not too long ago when I said that very thing. I will. We will see the glory of God. Why? Because I know it's coming. I believe it. I don't have the Holy Spirit in the box. And so I know that we'll see. I want to see the supernatural things of God. Right. And so I no longer um, am I in that box that keeps the Holy Spirit in a box. And I all things are possible. It's all it's all opened up and I'm going to see it. And so as we get closer, guys, we need to be equipped. We need to know the word of God. But I want you to think about that. The enemy is ever telling you, you don't really have what it takes. You don't really know what to say. You just remember that the church began when the Holy Spirit came upon the 120 people. That's where our church began. So they had the Holy Spirit and they had stories. They had nothing on us, right? And so we've got to remember that. We do have the benefit of the word, but you know, God, God actually read it. You can't just read it when your pastor's going over it. You have to read it. And, and as you've heard me say, again, something I've said so many times before, I don't know how many books I've read, but the Bible is the only one that can read me. And so I've got to be in the word of God so he can read me, equip me, uh, prepare me, whatever, speak to me through uh, with the, with the couple that with the Holy Spirit through his word. Right. But boy, you know, enough of the whole um it wasn't Easter wonderful, put away the little bunnies until next year. And thank you, Jesus. That was such a gift a price you pay and go back to business as usual. Uh-uh, I'm not, I'm not. And I pray you don't either because it's that focus on the cross 
that will keep us propelled to share the gospel, to do what we were created to do, and to fulfill the great commission that is true for all of us. That's everybody's job, not just pastors. Everybody's given the same job. And not a gender thing, by the way, the way many churches want to teach us. All of us, all of us are supposed to be telling the stories. All of us. Amen. Yes. Amen. Anything else, folks? I would like to say it was very powerful and it was very informative for me. I'm I'm new to this and um, it's I'm late in coming, but uh, you bring it alive to me and I learned so much and I want to thank you. Oh my goodness, I'm just so grateful. You know how each one found their way. How we ended up together is a beautiful thing, right? It really yes. is, and that warms my heart. You know to think that. God can use us, right? Even with this simple tool, uh, you know, to be online and somebody tells somebody and, and here we are. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So you believe me, you bless me more than I could ever bless you. I just thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Lynn. You betcha. Anybody else, Daryl, you've been quiet. Well, as usual, Lynn, a wonderful message. It's right to the heart of things. And we appreciate you. Stay and the down. glory of God shall fill the whole earth as uh, the waters fill the sea. Mm -hmm. Depending on which version you're reading, of course. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, you know, I look at people like yourself, Daryl, that like eons ahead of me. You know, you, you understood things in the sphere long before I was still stuck in my doctrinal mode right, where I didn't understand all those things. And so, uh, you know, we all work together now and we all are heading in the same direction, but um, I, can't, I can't stress to each one enough to, to get God out of that box. You're gonna need him out of that box, right? And, and when we read his word, uh, you know, he, he's not put in a box in his word. Man puts him in a box. And so all things really are possible and we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. But the days ahead, you know, not only will they be uh, more challenging, but more supernatural. And, you know, I don't want to be like the disciples that said, oh, big deal, the earth shook. Oh, big deal, the sun's light fell. Oh, big deal, the curtain ripped. I'm going to go hide. Mm -mm, not me. I'm not doing it. Mm -mm. I'm going to pray you don't either because we have everything we need. And if that's the way I lead this earth, <laughs> if that's going to be it, I get persecuted or something. Wow. What a way to go. You know, because I, I listen, my address is going to change. I follow Billy Graham with that. Don't be looking for me. I just got a new address. I didn't. <laughs> don't cry. I just got a new address. And my address is going to be in glory. Right. In glory. Hallelujah. So uh, post Easter message, and uh, again, I, I just pray that it resonate in your heart, Herman, I think it does yours, and uh, just carry it with you every day, guys, we're going to need all the strength we can get, all the power we can get, and it's all right there at our fingertips, we just got to quit trying to carry it, like Carmen said, quit trying to carry it, quit trying to own it, and learn to, 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 to fight the battle the way we should, you know, I'm sharing, I don't know if I've told you guys, I get mixed up with morning and night now, um, but you know how more and more, you remember when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He, he, he wasn't saying Satan's there, but Satan was working through him, right? And so I, more and more in my life, when I see people trying to you d discourage me or to, you know, to, to, to pick on my faith and a lot of, you know, kindness, or I'm your friend. So I just want you to be prepared. No, no, no. I get behind me, Satan. So I'm really looking more and more at what warfare looks like and how. God, excuse me, the devil can use people just to send a message to his own people. So, you know, we've got to know how to do the battle. If we don't know how to, no war has ever been won by people that didn't know how to fight the war, didn't know anything about their enemy, didn't have any weapons, didn't have anything, just a prayer closet. That's not going to happen. We've got to fight back. And the way we do that, again, is we are reminded every day of... The, the victory of the cross, conquering death, but all the supernatural things that knit it all together. When Jesus said, you know, I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you, and then I'll tell you what I told you. 
And boy, do we have a mess as loud and clear, right? So let me pray us out of here. Gracious Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we're so grateful. It's so exciting, Lord, to, to just to study your word, to look at these things, Lord, and to have you illuminate certain things for us that, that are just so important for all of us, Lord. And, I, and everyone here knows that you take me out there first to the woodshed or whatever to give me a message, Lord. So my heart's already soaring uh, before I even share with my brothers and sisters, Lord, but we are so excited. We don't want to lose sight of those supernatural things. We don't want to look at supernatural and then go hide under the bed. We want to be empowered, Lord, and we, we have the Holy Spirit and we have stories, Lord. We have, and we have the word of God so much more than the early church had. So Lord, help us to fight this. Help us to be propelled, Lord, like never before out there as warriors in this dark world, Lord, being the light of the, uh, and the salt of the earth. Lord, we just thank you for it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, guys, I love you. And you know where to find me if you need me. Thank you, Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, guys. God bless you. See you next time. Bye-bye.